Hi, and welcome to Extra Serving, a Nation's Restaurant News Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Petri. Today is a very special episode. You won't hear a conversation between me and my co-hosts. Instead, you'll hear three dynamic interviews with some of the executives who were at Create the Experience this week in Palm Springs. If you weren't able to make it this year, we're going to Nashville next October for another epic few days of learning from your colleagues. Today, you'll hear Jeff Chandler, CEO of Hop Dottie, Tracy Kim, CEO of Dig, and Michael Jong, Chief Operating Officer of Hawkers. What do these three have in common? They're all emerging regional brands looking to grow. If you want to tell us about your emerging brand, you can email me at holly.petri at informa.com. Now here's Jeff Chandler. Stratus Foods is the industry partner you can depend on when you're looking for the very best in fats and oils. Our team of expert researchers, developers, and innovators have helped countless businesses just like yours bring their most delicious menus to life. With products that are reliable, sustainable, and ready to meet any challenge, you can fry, bake, saute, and grill with confidence. Stratus Foods, we've got you covered. How are you, Jeff Chandler? I'm doing great. The CEO of Hop Dotty. How many locations do you guys have now? We have 48 now. And you just implemented a kind of a big menu change. You introduced more regenerative meat. Why don't you please tell us about that? Absolutely. This is this will have a profound impact on the future of hop dye. We are we're 100% sure of that. Um, we see an opportunity to really own the space in being the, the leading provider of regenerative proteins in a fast casual environment. And what does that mean? It means just looking at the way that we source and spec our products and our protein to be grown regeneratively. And again, what is that? It's, it's done in a way that is maximizing um, and conserving soil and improving soil health. And we just think that that's the future of where we're going. There's so many groups out there that are you know, anti-beef, and one of the reasons they're anti-beef is because of the destructive nature of historically what cattle ranching has done and feedlots have done. And we see an opportunity to reverse that and give beef a really good name. And, you know, you see a lot of people are calling for bans on beef and all these things. And we're like, no, beef is great. It's just how it's grown and how it's raised. So we're excited that we, we can be part of the solution and how we promote that going forward. And we're going to lead by example. Well, as I understand it, if you raise beef in a regenerative way with the intensive grazing and so on, if you do it right, it actually sequesters more carbon than the methane that the cattle belch. Some people think cattle fart. No, they belch methane, Absolutely. which is a little more troubling, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> and and that, that's, that's part of the equation. The other part of it is just, you know, monocrops and tilling and, you know, and preserving the ground crop covers and, you know, getting into perennial crops and, and just looking at how we farm and harvest food in this country. And, and I, so I see this big sway and this big movement going, but we think that that's, that'll catch on. And there's some folks doing some fascinating experiments like, you know, Ted Turner and what they are doing on his ranches is, is fantastic. And you don't see a lot about it, but they are really experimenting with different cover crops and how they can get into these crop rotations in a very uh, naturalistic way without a lot of outside inputs. Yeah, and different cover crops uh, bring different nutrients to the soil. So yep. as you rotate it, you can have really wonderful, Absolutely. rich soil. Yep. And happy cattle, or in the case of Ted Turner, bison, yeah. eating uh, a yummy variety of uh, crops that also happen to be really good for the soil. Yeah. They're, they're, they're experimenting with, I think, a pretty innovative approach, and that is they try to get back into, like, natural evolution of how things went like okay what when the bison roamed what did they eat when did they eat it eat it and so forth and so they're experimenting now like you go to their ranch you won't see their traditional feedlots right so they have grass-fed grass-finished bison they also have grass-fed grain finished but on the grain finished it's interesting they will leave grain out for the animals to choose what it wants to eat so there's corn, there's all the traditional feed, but they're not, they're, they're giving the animals the choice. And their, their um, uh, hypothesis is, is it'll be the most healthy way for that animal to eat. And it'll, it'll show up in, in the quality of the, the protein. So the, yeah, the animals know what's good for them. Yes. 
Uh, yeah. Just like, well, I mean, we know what's good for us, but we still like to, like to Indulge. eat, you know, yeah. Yeah, candy and potato chips <laughs> and stuff. Um, which is sort of what uh, a, a really super high grain diet would be to uh, cattle or bison. But it, it sounds like what they're doing is they get grain, but they also get to eat all the other different grasses. They get so. to eat everything else, right? And so it makes a, a, a better package, a more holistic nutritional intake that, you know, at the end of the day, it just protein that tastes better and, and better for you. And you guys are based in Austin and you're working with an Austin based uh, ranch also, right? We are. So we are, we have partnered with Force of Nature, uh, innovative, regenerative ranch that is, is really you know, promoting this on a big way. And so um, they have been great. There's, you know, that's kind of what inspired us to get into it in the first place. Um, and, you know, over time, our hope is, is that we can quickly ramp up enough production so that we can move 100% regenerative. Right now, we can source maybe 30, 40%. Uh, we think in the next 12 months, we can get to 100% on the beef side. We already currently right now do it on the chicken, on the turkey, and on the bison side. So we don't, you know, we've got production for that. Um, but it'll be a lag time. You know, and then, then excitingly, we're working on regenerative wheat. So we're, we're working on ways that we can actually buy wheat regeneratively raised to give it to our processors for our buns. Whoa. So we That's can cool. kind of completely make that statement as well. And, and it's, you know, it's, um, we think it's the right thing to do and it's, it's just the right thing to do. Well, and this isn't the first time you've been, you, you used regenerative meat, right? As I remember... Correct. If I remember correctly, the Lambda Lambda Burger that we gave That's you right. the Menu Masters Award exactly. for was uh, from regenerative lamb. Mm-hmm. That's something that your corporate chef, Matt Schweitzer, said at the Menu Masters party. He was like, yay, regenerative lamb, which was cool. Uh, so was that the first time? That was the first time that we, we did something outside of the bison space. So we led with bison. That was the first time we went outside with that. And, you know, I'll give Matt a lot of credit. Matt is a visionary in a lot of ways, and he sees he sees trends before they developed. I think you and I had a conversation about this. And, you know, um, Matt came to me maybe eight, nine months ago with regenerative. And, you know, eight, nine months ago, no one, nobody else was really talking about that. And so um, we're fortunate that we got on it early. And Matt's been leading the charge for us in that, in that regard. Awesome. But how, how do you get the message out, since most people have no idea what regenerative means? Yeah. So it's an all-out assault on a campaign, and we, at the same time, we eliminated um, all of the fake meat options. And for us, it was a statement around quality and making sure that we felt 100% secure in, in the things that we were selling. And so, you know, we're not against veggie burgers, absolutely whatsoever. Embrace it. Do the best version of it you can. Uh, but and you guys wanted, have a veggie burger. We right? do, and it's wonderful, and it's great. It's one of my favorites, my wife's favorite, and, and we eat it all the time. But real food. So at the center of what we want to do is just focus on real food, simple food, done very, very well. And at the heart of regeneration, regenerative practices, it is about simplicity. Think about it. It's just the way that nature intended it to grow and be harvested. So, so are you buying all of Force of Nature's beef now? Because you got we, 48 locations. We so. are buying, they are sourcing 100% of it for us. That's correct. Oh, I see. So it's not necessarily just from no. their ranch. But from they they do a great job of co-oping and sourcing it from, you know, making sure that it's their certified regenerative ranches and we buy purchase from them. Uh, so you just did this, what, a few weeks ago? Just three weeks ago. So we launched a new menu, new product lineup. Uh, in conjunction, we are launching a new oil. We are getting away from seed oils, and we are going with, a, I think, a very innovative oil company called Zero Acre Farms. It's made from uh, sugar cane, and it's, sugar cane's a perennial crop. It fits into the regenerative mode really well. But the Zero Acre oil is fantastic if you haven't had it it's it's lighter it's crispy it's more healthier there's less caloric input less saturated fat in your foods Um, and so we're excited to kind of roll out just a whole new um, uh, platform for hop dotty to advocate for health of the planet and human health and a perennial crop is more beneficial because you don't have to yank it out of the ground and and till the soil all that it grows very little inputs you know, no external water, um, you know, no chemicals, that, that type of thing. So 
three weeks in, have you have you been able to register much uh, response from your guests? We have a lot of curiosity, and there's still a ton of misunderstanding. People think regenerative meat. What's that? Is it grown in a lab? Does it regenerate itself? Do the cells duplicate? Like, okay, what what is it about regenerative? And so. Um, you know, our, our efforts really focus on educating our team members first, getting them excited about it. If we do that right, they tell the story. Uh, we have tried to back that up with a lot of point of purchase material in restaurants, new menus, new menu boards. I'm really just trying to do a great job of singing the, uh, the praises of regenerative and, and doing it in a way that people understand because it's, it can be wordy. So practicing that pitch to our guests. Yeah, it has to be hard because... The consumer's attention span is so short, and just trying to like, and you're trying to sell burgers, and fries, and right. beer, and stuff. Right. So that's it's a journey, Brett. We haven't perfected it yet. We're still trying to figure that out. Well, in you terms haven't of perfected how we simplify it. In a few weeks? it. Not yet. Okay. And I think it's going to be. I, I, my prediction is is a year from now, this will be much more common household ish. It'll be like organic. Uh, but I and I, I hope a year's time from now we'll be sitting here talking about it. everybody will know regenerative and I mean that certainly is possible because once something kind of hits it happens really quickly like yeah. 10 years ago if you talked about food waste people would say what now who who cares and also how can we fix it and it's not that big a deal right now everybody knows that's right that it's a huge problem and how much of a problem right. it is and and everything we can do to fix it and we're excited, you know, there's, um, there was a, a movie made called Kiss the Ground that was launched a couple years back to kind of, you know, talk about the regenerative farming agriculture. Um, there's a new one called Common Ground, which just launched. In fact, the premiere will be in Austin on Wednesday, and we're excited to be a co-sponsor of that, that launch. But I, so I think media will get a hold of it, entertainment, and there's a lot of celebrities behind this, which they're going to use their influence status to get the word out to folks. Um, and, you know, I think the collective, we, we were looking at it from a social media perspective, the collective audience was over 100 million people uh, in the folks that were promoting this. So we hope that through that continued push, we'll get the word out. Well, in the, the film, there are like a bunch of superstars. Yeah. Uh, Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson, and Jason Momoa. Yeah, exactly. Laura Linney, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great pul- pulpit. So that definitely helps tell the story and get, get the awareness and the education. So I'm also here with my, my colleague, Holly Petrie, who I think had in, an interesting thought about how uh, this might have a, a way to appeal to people who have stopped eating meat. If they're stopping eating meat for environmental reasons, bringing meat in as part of the sustainability conversation could be exciting. It's definitely one of the aspects. And when we talk to our guests, our consumers, that's kind of one of the things they say. There's, you know, people are intentional about why they eat or don't eat meat. Part of it could be animal welfare. Part of it could be health. Um, part of it could be, you know, um, uh, the ecological damage it does to the, the earth. And so I think by eliminating one of those big factors, absolutely, there might be people that say, yeah, I'm going to try it now. I feel good. I feel, I feel good that you're taking this, this seriously and improving the soil health. But I have a number of friends who are, are former vegetarians, and once they started eating meat, they were like, what, why, why wasn't I eating this before? I have other uh, yeah, friends yeah. who are uh, hardcore, uh, diehard vegetarians or vegans, and good for them. That's what they, that's what they yeah. want to do. They absolutely should. Yeah. And you have solutions for them also. I think that's what really, we really embrace at the core of Hop Dotty is we've got choices. So the, the brand was really built on quality, uniqueness, and variety. And it's that variety segment that I think is really important. We want to celebrate and have the best beef available, right? But if you don't eat beef, great. We want to celebrate and have the best chicken, turkey, tuna, bison, whatever that might be. And and I and so in that quest to celebrate that, we're going to source out and find the best and present it and give it to people. Um, whatever they choose, it's like a buffet table. Whatever they choose to go to first, that's up to them. Our, our option, our obligation is to have quality options for them to choose from. Jeff, how did you get wrapped up in Hop Dottie? What were you doing before? You know, I was introduced to Hop Dottie. It's funny. It was in a restaurant tour probably back 12 years ago, right when Hop Dottie first started. We were coming to Austin, and on the list was, you've got to see this place called Hop Dottie. They, you know, I think the quote was, they, they, you know, they sell 
$2 million a year in margaritas and they're, you know, doing $200,000 a week in sales and we wanted to go see it. And, and I fell in love with the smell of the place, the fresh baked buns. I fell in love with the quality of the beef. And back then there was a very artisan approach to grinding our own proteins and baking fresh bread. And, and so it, it, it captured my attention. And when I realized there was an opportunity to come down and help lead and grow and expand, it, I, was, I was all in. Now, the smell reminds me of another question that I had, because you mentioned regenerative wheat, yes. which is interesting. What, what, where is that coming from? So uh, more and more people are growing it. The, our source right now would come out of Kansas, a little bit of Montana, um, and I think Missouri. Is this the Kernza, the perennial wheat, or is it a different thing? It is. And uh, grown by different folks, and, and it's you know really early on, but you know we're we're looking to secure up to five million pounds of it um, that we can then make a claim that it's regeneratively grown wheat. Yeah, because you know? it is perennial. It's like a hybrid of like wheat and perennial grasses. Yeah, and so looking at the protein content and looking to make sure that it's it's it falls within our spec. But it it's exciting, and again, it, it just goes to show that. This this farming practice is now spreading outside of just cattle ranching or, or you know growing growing feed crops. Well, and that's a really interesting product because it's trying to solve a problem that we started ten thousand years ago when we started raising perennial grain or annual grains that we had to just keep harvesting and, and no, utility. That's absolutely right. So it's it's a whole new kind of era, and yeah. I, I've. I don't know if I've ever tried it, but I hear that it tastes kind of grassy. Is that, are there So in our early, uh, the batches that we've done early, really, we, we cannot tell the difference. Oh, in, in the way that it's constituted and the way that we've milled it, we had it milled for us uh, and then shipped over to our bun manufacturer um, now. Um, uh, our current recipe, no, there's, there's no noticeable difference. Great. Which is, which is good. So what, what well, can we expect, I don't know, in the coming months or a couple of years from Hop Dottie, whether it's food or new locations or whatever? You're going to see us continue to push the envelope on what a burger is. Um, so quality, uniqueness, variety, we really want to lead in all three of those things. We want to be known as the innovative, out-of-the-box thinking burger company. Uh, we want to take the burger experience and elevate it into a very approachable manner so that everybody can enjoy it. Price point wise, use occasion wise, we, you know, we just want to be the everyday quality, unique, elevated burger variety place. It's interesting in talking with Todd Wilson, who Todd and I used to work together. Todd now is a CFO of a Red Robin. And, you know, I grew up as a fan of Red Robin because Red Robin used to have the most creative, wild, cool, fun burgers, right? And unlimited fries. And unlimited bottomless fries and mocktails that were super cool. Well, it's, you know, he tells the story of going back to that. And G.J. Hart, who's there now, is telling the story of getting back to what made them great in the first place. And essentially, it's Hop Dottie, in a way. And so I think the concept is, tr- is tried and true, and, you know, people love just the hamburger, especially in this country. And our, 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 what, what continues to drive us is just reinventing what a hamburger can mean, right? So different flavors, different food profiles. Um, and really having fun with it and not taking ourselves so seriously. So I think continuing to innovate and always looking at how we can do right by the earth, by human health and our team members um, so that we're here for a long time. And you have like a straightforward burger, like just an ordinary burger. Our number one selling burger is a classic, classic, classic with cheese and every different variation of classic. I think 62% of all burgers sold are a form of a classic. So that's still our bread and butter. So... I mean, I, I ask this question of many uh, new product developers. If, if the majority of people are getting your classic, why spend all this energy on the innovation? Yeah, um, <laughs> because I think through elevating what a burger can be, it, it, you know, a rising tide floats all boats, right? So, you know, by drawing attention to our culinary acumen and our innovation, I think people then say they place more value on 
our, our, our classic. Our classic, it, it's elevated because we also do all of these fun, creative, high-quality burgers with high-quality ingredients. And if you have 62% of the people buying your classic, you got 38% who are not. So yes. And I think we want them to have a reason to come back and try something, right? We saw it today in the opening session with Data, Centri uh, Data Essentials mm -hmm. was that creativity and that innovation and always giving something that's craveable that they can't get at home, like that, that drives us. And so they might have the classic, but they might see the bitty bitty bun bun or the ahi tuna burger or something that like, oh my God, I want to come back and try that next time. So hopefully there's more trial, more incentive that builds to more repeat loyalty and increased frequency use occasion. Well, and even if they think I want to try that next time and they come back and get the classic again, that's fine. That's fine too. <laughs> they love so it. You know, we find it is interesting um, when, when a hop dotty guest has two favorites, they come twice as much. Oh, great. Because, but when they just have one favorite, you know, they don't think about it as often, but when there's two, it, it's like, it is over, I don't know what the status, it's over two times, it's over twice as much. It's, it's exponential, right? They, they, they just, they have two favorites and they crave it and they go back and forth. So our whole thing with our specials is trying to innovate to find something that is somebody's, also their favorite. Wow, that's interesting. Good. And so it doesn't cannibalize the original right. one. Right. It's, it's all it's incremental. It's just an all incremental is the, is, the, is the ultimate goal. How about in terms of beverage innovation? What are you guys up to? You know, we've gone, we've gone, we've run the gamut on bed, uh, menu innovation or on, on the bar side. And we're kind of going back to the drawing board. We used to do a lot of different drinks. None of them sold. We kind of went and said, hey, we just need to focus on the basics. We're a margarita and craft bar. Let's just own it and do the best job we can. We're now back to thinking we do need to innovate. So um, we are working on that with the idea that we would have a series of maybe seasonal cocktails that we would roll out that represent and, and are alignment with our food. Because right now we think that's, we're, we're, we're kind of stuck on margaritas and craft beer, which is great. We can do better. Something for people to look forward to, to have with their regenerative burger. Always that and something seasonal that's different. Magic. Well, thanks for hanging out, Jeff Chandler, Absolutely. No, during the Korean conference, me. and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Fantosi, Senior Editor with Nation's Restaurant News. Uh, we're here with Tracy Kim of Dig, formerly known as Dig In. Uh, uh, at, we're both New Yorkers. <laughs> um, and so I guess just to start things off, um, what are you most excited about at Create? Are you having a good time so far? Fantastic time. I mean, first of all, being in Palm Springs is really fun. Uh, it's just a great, it's my first time actually being at a Create conference, and so I'm very impressed with the number of just industry experts uh, that are around for networking and getting advice and just having a general sort of, you know, people in the same boat kind of talking about the same problems. It's been great. And for our listeners that might not be familiar, uh, Dig is a New York City-based, used to be mostly lunch spot um, and lots of like really nutritious food. Uh, proteins and sides. Um, my personal favorite is the salmon with pesto sauce. Um, and uh, so I guess just um, what is top of mind for you right now with the brand? Um, what are you, what are you, what's like at the top of your to-do list right now? Yeah. Um, as you articulate prior to COVID, COVID was a thing for the restaurant industry, certainly for us. Um, prior to COVID, as you mentioned, we were really sort of a better for you kind of lunch bowl concept. We had a lot of urbanites, mostly office workers, and top of mind for us is really sort of post-COVID, the world has changed. The hybrid work environment is here to stay, is our belief, or at least in some version, here to stay. And so really being able to diversify sort of our offering and our portfolio is very important to us. So strategically, from a real estate and location perspective, we're now not just in New York. We're in New York. We're in Boston. We're in Philly. We opened in D.C., New Jersey, and Connecticut earlier this year. Um, and then from a, I guess, uh, a neighborhood perspective, we used to be primarily, we're very urban dense in terms of our portfolio, but we are now sort of spreading out, not only in markets, but also to suburban markets. So it's been, the thing for us that we're lucky about is that we are scratch cooking. We're better for you cooking. We do it all in the restaurants. Um, and it is an application that works well in the suburbs as well as urban, urban environments. And so 
whether you're an office worker who is coming in for sort of a, a healthy-ish, we call it healthy-ish lunch, as we do have things like mac and cheese, as you probably know. Yeah. Um, or if you're a family in the suburbs who is looking for, I mean, I'm admittedly in that camp where every night at six o'clock, I'm like, oh God, when am I going to feed my family for dinner? It's a very easy sort of, we have an offering as an example called the Dig Dinner Box, which really, a, a, you know, it's a family or a group of four kind of dinner box offering. Super easy. Super high value, 48 bucks um, to feed a group of four uh, is really the thing that we're trying to focus on. Um, diversifying that day part, diversifying our geography, um, just you know, being a little bit more broad in terms of our consumer base and guest um, use cases. So as you kind of branch out in kind of new demographics and new geographical areas, what are some of the challenges of uh, portfolio diversification? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are several, to be honest. I mean, it's very, very exciting opening a new geography. I think the first is just brand halo and brand awareness. It's a lot of work opening up a new market. In New York City, we're lucky. We've been around for over 10 years, and so the awareness is pretty good. Our market, Jessica, who's our head of marketing, would say we have so much work to do, even in New York. Um, but, but really the brand awareness with regards to a new market is really uh, kind of the most significant I guess, project that we have to undertake when we're going, you know, entering some of these new markets. That's one. Two is operationally, if we open in New York City, it's really easy for us to transfer staff here or there. Or if somebody forgets to order their charred chicken marinade, they can borrow it from another restaurant that's half a mile away. In the outer markets, you have to be pretty good. You, you have to be pretty self-sufficient. You have to be pretty spot on with your ordering. You have to be constantly hiring uh, you don't have kind of the cushion or the safety uh, cushion of New York City backup. So those have been some of the challenges. Um, again, sort of uh, marketing, consumer awareness, and, and operational, just being outside of our New York City base. So what is your kind of strategy for brand awareness in those areas outside of New York City? Um, for us, what we have found has worked very well is sort of really driving kind of that almost neighborhood go-to spot. Uh, vibe, we get really, really close into the local store marketing. That's been most effective for us in terms of just getting entrenched into the community, into sort of working with the chambers of commerce, in terms of wor working with the neighborhood associations. Like when we opened in Georgetown in D.C., we were hand in hand with that Georgetown Neighborhood Association because they know everyone, they know all the business, and they want you to be successful. So uh, being in their food festivals, being with their local fundraisers, that's really how we've sort of attracted brand awareness. Um, you know, we do a fair amount of sort of like out of home in places where people are, like as an example, with our Stanford, Connecticut opening, we were all over to Metro North just because that was where that, com you know, that consumer base was. You have a captive audience staring at your out of home kind of, um, you know, advertisement. That's, that's sort of what we double down on. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, what did prompt that name change a few years back? I don't that's remember exactly question. when it was. <laughs> It was 2018, I think. 2018, 2019. Time I know, goes by fast. Time goes by fast. <laughs> I feel like the world froze during COVID for a couple of right. years. So, you know, time does go by fast. Yeah, so back back in the day, what prompted that name change is that the company was sort of being more, uh, was trying to get into more than just restaurants. So we owned a farm. We had our restaurants. Um, you know, we had just sort of, uh, were thinking about doing like a training facilities for chefs and training, that kind of thing. So that's what prompted that. Um, you know, sort of post-COVID, we're really sort of focusing on the restaurants, which is the core business, uh, do still believe in kind of the training academy approach and sort of, you know, foundationally starting to build that up. Um, but believe with regards to, we do believe in sort of maintaining those farm connections, but don't necessarily, you know, feel like we have to own that. We have a lot of relationships with local farmers that we've continued to maintain over the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you tell me more about that training academy? So... I mean, it's restaurant business is a peep, as is obvious, it's all dependent on human capital. And so our ability to really sort of lean in, what's very sort of differentiating, I think, about our teams is that they're just the culinary je ne sais quoi is just it's just it's just in the cultural DNA. And so it's really important for us to kind of maintain uh, that we're really sort of teaching cooking. We're teaching cooking. It's everything about like the heart, the family, the soul, we're teaching cooking. Um, and so all of our training is first and foremost centered around kind of culinary excellence. And we can take somebody off the street and really give them a career path by really teaching them some of these, some of these, you know, knife skills or life skills kind of thing. Um, 
you know, as they advance in their career for the people who stay with us, you then sort of learn things like general management, running a business, running a restaurant, uh, learning how to become a leader. Suddenly not being the person who's actually doing all the shifts, but like leading the shifts. Um, so our training is really sort of, you know, sort of staged in that way. So being able to climb that ladder probably goes hand in hand with figuring out uh, how to best tackle the labor problem that most of the entire industry is facing. Uh, and so how would you say just kind of having that career path in mind uh, for, for your employees kind of helps helps you with, uh, you know, making sure that they stay on board for more than six months? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the career path is everything. I mean, I think that for many of our people, I mean, it is hard to go to, to, go to a promotion that we have and not be in tears by the end of it because it's always like some amazing story about someone who's really risen up from great hardship to being able to run a, run a restaurant and lead a restaurant. Um, I think because we inter primarily internally promote, honestly, uh, throughout the ranks up until the restaurant leader and then to the multi-unit leader, I mean, it's been primarily internal promotions. I do think that we walk to walk in terms of really trying to train and develop our people. Um, that path and that ability, if you want it, to become a leader in the industry, to become a leader of a business, um, you're running, you know, a multi-million dollar business at that point is quite compelling to many of our staff. And so many of our many of our restaurant leaders are actually sort of longtime veterans with us. Um, I think of one of our star multi-unit uh, leaders, a woman named Shauna. She started with us as a teenager, as an hourly worker as a teenager. She's been with us for 12 years and is now running multiple restaurants and is amazing at her job. These are the things, you know, that that make it all worth it. We love it. So we're very, very dedicated to this effort. That's amazing. Yeah, having that path to leadership, I think, is just so important um, and, and, and making sure that, you know, people have the resources to be able to move up in a company. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would not be me without asking about tech. Um, so uh, so as, as the tech reporter, I feel like I'm, I'm, always, I'm always asking companies that are, you know, not the 400 location companies, like, what does your tech stack look like? And what is, what is your biggest challenge right now when it comes to digital tech? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think right now, at the time that we had to build our tech stack, it was a time when a lot of third-party sort of outsourced providers were actually not available to the company. And so we built a relatively bespoke tech stack in terms of our kitchen management system, in terms of our KDS. Um, so right now, we're actually trying to outsource part of that stack just to be able to become more scalable and to an outsourced tech stack that will really support us from 30-something restaurants where we are today to, you know, some triple figure number of restaurants. And so that's been sort of the strategy from sort of the, call it the kitchen management end. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to the front end, to the consumer end, we do have, you know, we do have our own app. Uh, we do have a loyalty program. I think what we would say is that we're in the midst of trying to figure out like what the right, and I think a lot of it, just in talking to people here, a lot of people are sort of trying to figure out like what the right way to handle loyalty is. The truth of the matter is there are a lot of people who actually don't really care about that free fill in the blank. Um, and so we're experimenting with this notion of a marketplace of rewards. And so this notion of sort of secret menu items or merch uh, could be more interesting to someone who's a, a very loyal customer base. So this notion of marketplace of rewards versus like tiered, um, we're sort of thinking through. Um, and then, you know, for us, like one of the biggest challenges is figuring out data is everything. And one of the reasons why we go to, uh, you know, we use technology is to be able to use that data very effectively to sort of personalize, et cetera, for our customers. Um, one of our challenges is actually sort of, uh, I guess, the aggregation of the visits that are walk-in versus on an app. So we're, we're still working through kind of that merging um, of understanding if somebody does both walk-in as well as sort of digital purchasing, kind of truly understanding, you know, having a one view of that customer, having a single view of that customer is still sort of a challenge that we're working through. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds kind of like you're still trying to fill in the blanks and shop around a bit. Um, yeah. It's, does it get overwhelming? Because I know that I know that's a lot of uh, operators are concerned with that. There's so many possible tech vendors out there. Yeah, it does. I mean, we we have a wonderful a woman named Melina is running our our product tech uh, group. Um, it is overwhelming to say the least, and we've made some mistakes along the way. Um, if I'm totally honest about it, but. Uh, at this point, we're so, so, so familiar with, you know, every piece of our tech stack and sort of where we need to outsource. And we're very, very firm on where we want to outsource versus keep in-house. Um, you know, it's amazing how quickly the number of vendors narrows down pretty quickly once you know your requirements inside and out. So yeah. 
Um, we're at the stage now where we feel like we're pretty, we know what we want. A year ago, I think we were pretty overwhelmed with the number of options that we had to research. Yeah. Um, and how do you guys figure out like what to keep in house and what to outsource? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we, we would outsource it if we could, but where we do want to own is where is on things that are related to the customer data. So we do want to own the customer data because we want to be able to, you know, use that to our, to our benefits and to our guests benefits. Um, outside of that, our preference would frankly be to outsource. Uh, there's so many great solutions out there. Um, it, it's just the guest data that we, we want to be careful about the ownership of. And uh, how do you think you, uh, like, what are some creative or out-of-the-box ways of, of how you're thinking to use guest data? Um, yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, it's starting from, there's so many ways that you could use guest data. Um, for us, we're still on the personalization journey is what I would say. So we're very, we're, we're lucky and, and not, you know, we have a very bifurcated set of guests. We have people who come see us seven times a week. I mean, we have like very, very loyalist cult members uh, those people we want to treat very differently than sort of the other end of the spectrum. Um, so, you know, we're starting to think through like the differentiation between sort of, uh, you know, lower use customers versus very loyal customers versus customer acquisition. I think pre COVID, because we were so concentrated in New York, we didn't have to worry that much about customer acquisition. People were just walking by and it was sort of like rent was our marketing budget in a way. Now with sort of a new world, we're having to work much harder for our customer acquisition. So that's really kind of the top of the funnel is really where we're focused. Yeah. And I think uh, one last thing, uh, you mentioned that you guys want to get into triple digits when it comes to locations. What is your strategy for expansion then? I mean, you know, we, of course, the more <laughs> in many ways, the more the better. We're, we're currently at thir in the low 30s in terms of number of locations. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in sort of four major metropolitan areas currently. Um, our strategy is actually to sort of fill in, there's a lot of space just in those areas that we're in. So sort of filling in the urban and the suburban space within those markets, especially in Philadelphia, DC and Boston. Uh, I think we're pretty good in, in New York for now. Uh, the suburbs of New York and Connecticut. And then start to make our way down the Eastern seaboard. I mean, just those states alone, we could get to a hundred easily. Yeah. Um, and of course, sort of, you know, we believe that our our, our product is sort of broad enough in terms of its appeal that we can pretty easily, it's a pretty appealing offering across the country uh, at some point. I think that you need to open more locations in the boroughs that aren't Manhattan. As someone that lives in Queens and wishes that I had a dig by my apartment and I don't. Okay, <laughs> noted. Queens is, Queens is on our list as is Westchester and Connecticut. We yeah. just opened our second Brooklyn location last okay, week awesome. actually on that horrible rainy day in New York. Oh no. We actually managed to get that restaurant open, and it was pretty well attended. We were we were totally. If I knew that it was going to be that torrential, we would have delayed it. Yeah, but it oh was, my God. You know, by the time it happened, we got all of our workers in. It took me five, four hours to get home that night, but uh, oh we got all goodness. of our workers in, and it was a really fun grand opening. So Queens oh is, wow. you know, Queens is on our list. We're all coming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. Really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Great. Thanks for having me. Sure. Michael, thanks a lot for joining us today. Appreciate it very much. My pleasure. In introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Hawkers concept. Well, my name is Michael Jong. I'm the COO for Hawkers, um, founded by four um, friends in Central Florida in 2011, um, primarily focused on delivering amazing Asian street food. We currently have 15 locations. Just opened up our newest restaurant in second restaurant in Dallas and north of the city in Addison. I'm based in Dallas. I've not been to your restaurant yet, but you said there have been some major changes, both back of house and front of house. Tell us what those are. Amazing design in the front. We actually have an in-house design team that does a great job of making the vibe feel like you're in the streets of Asia. So as, as um, great restaurants try to do, really provide an engaging experience that puts someone in the travels, just like you were going to the streets of Asia, that's what we've done in Addison. And in the back of the house, leveraging uh, new technology, combi, com combi ovens, excuse me, um, which replace the traditional Chinese roasting boxes, which allows the chef's team to really elevate the recipes, build in some efficiencies, um, and make our food just that much more better. 
What have the combi ovens uh, menu-wise, a new item that's on the menu that we can look forward to? Five spice, um, excuse me, five spice um, crispy ribs. That is the biggest thing. And I'm telling you, if you have a chance to go into Addison while you're in Dallas, when you get back, it's the thing to get. It's one of my favorite new dishes. Um, it really is uh, so delicious. It's consistent. And it's a, a recipe that the line cooks, prep cooks, they love to do it because it's so great on the plate. Visually, it's awesome, tastes delicious, and it's easy to execute. What's the best seller for those units that don't have the combi ovens? Well, starting with roti canai, I think that's the, the big thing that everyone in our restaurants tries to get. Um, our servers love talking about it because when guests get it for the first time with our homemade curry dipping sauce, it's a non, it's a craveable item. People are nonstop with the sauce. Beneath that, if you're looking at a noodle dish, it's by far the pad thai across all 14 restaurants that are open. Pad thai is our biggest seller. And then from there, it really bifurcates a little bit. We go into Korean twice fried rings and then soup dumplings. From there, it goes back into rice and noodles. So we're very fortunate that a, a high proportion of the menu items are so craveable that guests start to come in, they share plates, and then they really start to see what, what uh, direction they want to go on the menu. Michael, you were founded in 2011. Yes. How have you seen the real estate market change, and what are your real estate requirements? Yeah, well, in the original restaurant, when it was um, first found by the founders, um, was a, a real estate play to come into the restaurant and revamp it. Um, that restaurant was done on a shoestring budget, and it was really piecemealed together just to get the restaurant opening. Now, I mean, that's probably gone through three iterations of what is the right square footage? Is it 4,000, 4,800, 5,000, uh, 5, a little bit more? Um, so some of the requirements, around 5,000 square feet, we really do look for the right neighborhood, the right corner, because you can be in the right neighborhood but not in the right spot. Um, we have a huge bar craft cocktail program. So having an indoor outdoor bar with nano walls or some type of garage door so that we can open up the space, make it more inviting, draw the eye across the entire space. And we really like to have some type of outdoor activity, some patio, lounge area, the large Jenga games, places that make it engaging so that it's a family experience. You can go in and feel comfortable while you go through the menu and try things out. The 15th location is in Dallas or, or close to, I guess, uh, Addison area. Yes. You're near an AMC theater and a yard house. What a, was attractive about that real estate? I think the, the well, there was a couple things. One, we're surrounded by what we believe to be great co-tenancy. So not only is um, yard house there, the AMC theater, Lazy Dog Cafe, um, Vidara, Stur, Snooze, Postinos is a great co-tenant for us. And people that, um, places where people like to go, they don't have to come to us all the time, but they know it to be a destination for great food, great vibe, great service, hospitality. We felt like that was a good corner for us. Uh, we just ran across uh, Lauren Bailey of Postino, as a matter of fact, uh, yes. before we started this. Uh, what do you see as the uh, challenges or hurdles for growth and the opportunities for growth in the next, uh, say, year, five years? I, th I think for me, that starts with consistency. So consistency at all levels through food service and vibe, which are the three staples for what we try and provide. Um, you know, the real estate market and options, I think, are becoming a little bit more condensed as the, the um, upcoming, you know, events happen through the economy. Um, logistically, I think really timing and making sure that you can sign the right leases and make sure that you're prepared not only... Um, uh, equipment and design, architectural, all the things that it takes to actually build the facility. Um, another part of that, which I think is super important, obviously, is to have the right infrastructure and do that with a thought process and be methodical about it. Um, so we want to make sure that we're backfilling. So if you look at our footprint from D.C. to Dallas in the southeast, we're in seven different states. But we want to start to backfill regions where we've planted a flag purposefully so that we can grow not only brand recognition, but make sure that we are have a good succession plan for our multi-unit team and for the GMs and chefs that help run the restaurant. Where, where is your corporate headquarters? In Orlando. It is in, in Orlando. Orlando. So easy to get in and out of. Oh, yeah, for sure. Love the airport there. <laughs> oh, what question did I not ask you that you'd like to answer? Oh, my gosh. Um, 
when is the first time you and I are going to eat at a Hawker's would probably be one question on my mind. Well, as soon as you make it to Dallas, I'm there. All right. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. And we're going to have the beef using the new ovens. Yes. Uh, yes. You mentioned that the 14th unit has been closed down for remodeling. Yes. What kind of remodeling are you doing? Uh, it's easy to open a new unit because you have a blank slate. Yeah. But how, when you remodel something, what are some of the things you're looking for? Well, the key component is to make sure that we can properly execute the, the brand design, right? So we want to make sure that whatever the guests are going to experience there is true to Hawkers, is true to what we're trying to do, trying to um, uh, provide for everyone. So uh, some of the challenges there were really just the constraints with uh, HVAC and the hood. So we have a lot of uh, walk intense, very hot, heat intense um, kitchens, making sure that we can provide the right um, equipment in the right place environment for team members to work and execute at a high level. We also have a few tricks up our sleeve that both the chefs and the co-founders want to try. Um, this restaurant will reopen in the Beltline sometime uh, Q1, Q2 of next year, but we're excited about it. Anything you're doing in the area of technology with your staff, you mentioned your team members, uh, to make their uh, onboarding and uh, work easier? Twofold. Um, one, going before the onboarding, is we've... Um, uh, at the beginning of this year, we um, provided 36 to 48 inch TVs. We put them in uh, replacement of where a traditional um, server schedule or communication board would be. So that board is run, uh, we call it Roti Vision. It's 24 7. It's designed to be specific to the restaurant. So a GM, Ron runs our restaurant in, in Village on the Parkway in Addison, and you want to recognize a team member, you take that picture you can put their picture up along with that recognition immediately so that as team members are going through, they check their schedule right next to it, but they look up and they see, oh my gosh, look at this great thing that just happened. On the other side of that, we can drive training, not only um, static content, PowerPoint slides, PDFs, but also video with audio. So if tomorrow we wanted to do a training on this is the most important create podcast that's out there and we want you to pay attention to it, we can push that down into our restaurants. So that coupled with this new video content that we're creating in both the front of the house and back of the house was pushed into the restaurant for pre-shifts and into orientation so that we can speed up the onboarding process for new team members, which we all know is super important. Excellent. Well, thanks for spending time with us, Michael. I appreciate it very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of Create, and thanks our, to our Lamborghini of uh, podcast uh, technicians here, Marlon, Marlon right. Gordon. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. My pleasure. Stratus Foods is the industry partner you can depend on when you're looking for the very best in fats and oils. Our team of expert researchers, developers, and innovators have helped countless businesses just like yours bring their most delicious menus to life. With products that are reliable, sustainable, and ready to meet any challenge, you can fry, bake, saute, and grill with confidence. Stratus Foods, we've got you covered.